talking to John Campbell now in a moment. Now, first of all, I have to talk to the... Good morning, sir. <laughs> I don't believe it. He can't... No, well, that's it. No, forget about it. That's it. Can't find the man on the telephone at all. What? Uh, John Campbell is with me. Good morning, John. Morning, Joey. You'll notice that I'm having a little trouble with his equipment yes, here. You understand that. that these things do happen once in a while. There's no reflection on my personality in any way. <laughs> I just can't get people. John, you've been very popular in this program, although you've never been on it, really. Uh, because particularly of uh, your book, uh, The Rose and the Blade. Uh, it sold very well, and I say this not as a person who's any financial interest in this at all, but I read a number of uh, a number of poems from it, and the reaction was tremendous. And uh, I assume that uh, people really like your stuff. I know they do. Uh, are you surprised that you kind of strike a chord there? Or? Well, uh, I'm not surprised in that fact, Jerry, but uh, I know that uh, the book sold specifically because of the... Um, publicity you gave it and of your readings of the poems uh, I mean it was quite incredible the uh, re the uh, report back I got on the book and I mean when I was going into my local bar crusaders the bar <laughs> maids would have been saying Jerry read one of your poems or Jerry's mm. looking for you or when are you going on the program <laughs> I mean th this was you yourself kept the book in, in the public eye well you know but it's 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 the content it's the stuff you know it's it's, it's the poems uh, I mean, have you always written? Yeah, well, for a long time, from when I was a, a boy, I wrote. Well, one of the main reasons I started to write was the change in face of York Street and the docks area, as as we know it now, it's completely obliterated. And um, I worked, I was a boy among men, and these men kept telling me, you know, that things were changing and that what we were seeing would not be there forever. And uh, one of them in particular, an old guy called David Wade, said he knew of my perchance for writing and, and mm. putting things down in paper. And he urged me to continue to write and to uh, record the changing that was happening in the York Street area and Sailor mm. Town area of Belfast, which I did because, I mean, writing is a hobby to me and uh, I really enjoy doing it. And over the years, I sort of way put together these journals of the change in face of that particular area and Belfast in general. Just for the benefit of people who aren't from Belfast, and, and of course I, I, I'm not from Belfast myself, uh, York Street was, uh, was demolished, so to speak, to make way for the M, what was the M2, wasn't it? Uh, the West Link, actually. West Link, um, yeah. yeah. Is, is it a fact that, do you know when you see that Midland building there, that used to be the Midland Hotel? That's correct. Is that roughly the, the area around there that York Street was? Yeah, well, if you would work from that building, if you would take that building from there up to the new center point building, which was the old cooperative building, hmm. and uh, the Midland Hotel is or was in a street called Whitless Street, you would have went as far as Great Patrick Street. Then you'd had three streets that ran along. That was York Street, um, early in Little York Street, Nelson Street, which is actually still there. The traffic still flows along Nelson Street. Mm. And then you'd have had Garmoyle Street and Corporation Street, which would have took you. Th that would have been the sum and essence of York Street. And uh, then on the other side of Corporation Street, toward the water side, that would have been technically Sailor's Town, or Sailor Town as some people would call it. But you called it Sailor's Town. Yeah. Well, I call it Sailor's Town. Other people call it Sailor's Town. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, um, Sailor's singular and Sailor's is plural. So, <laughs> so I, I, I suppose that you think, and I would imagine too, because uh, at that time, that was a terribly rash act, in the, act of the, on the part of the planning department, it just demolished, just obliterated um, a, a thriving community. Well, you see, we're going back to the old storm out there, Jerry, when uh, the things people, happened. Did, yeah, no. people did what they were told. I mean, there was no, you wouldn't have street protests or anything like that because, uh, I mean, it wouldn't have been allowed in yeah. the first instance. There was, I have to say, there was um, a contingent of people who remained down in the Sailor Town area uh, in the Pilot Street, uh, Princess Dock area, who were rewarded or, or uh, either way, they, they uh, got houses built there at Earth Street, just right beside, or at Henry Street, just right beside the motorway and uh, the smoke and stench that comes from there. But the people are happy there, but at least there is people in the York Street area. But as I would say, they're on the other side of York Street. The area I would be uh, dealing with would be the area, again, between York Street and Corporation Street, in that sort of a square. And you've got, I, I, cannot, I don't like that kind of thing, you know, uh, I, I've seen examples of that before. It all seemed to happen in the 60s for some strange reason. Uh, I, I, I know an example in where I come from myself in Derry Stoke, London, there, there was an 18th, sorry, a 19th century jail intact. 
that had been used up until about like 40, 50 years ago. It was a, you know, a very, very lovely building. And people knocked it down and they built flats. And what they did was there was a kind of a turret. This is a huge jail. They knocked it, flattened it. And there was a little turret on it. What they did was they took the turret off and put it on top of one of the flats. And every time I look at it, I say, my God, you know how stupid people can be. But uh, the main thing about your poetry, uh, as me looking at it as a stranger, is the way you catch the spirit of the people. Uh, you're talking about the Rinty Mullahans of this world. You're talking about characters. Could you give us just a wee example of maybe people who don't know much about your work? Could you just give us, give us a wee example of something that you've written there, something in the book, or anything that you would like to read is just at the start. Well, <clears throat> I could read you a poem called uh, Sing a Song of York Street, which which would take us back to that. Mm. And um, it, it would mention some of the characters in the, yeah. in the area who are long since gone, who have, you know, died and passed on. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> this poem's called Sing a Song of York Street. Sing a Song of York Street. Take me back again to Big Davy and Buck I like as they brawl in stable lane. With dovers screaming round them, they fought a brutal bout, wearing only trousers, with their bellies hanging out. Tell me about the chancers, the hard chaws, and the brass. Sing a song about the days that all too soon have passed. The square sets and the pavers and the gas lamps have all gone. The characters have vanished, but the memories linger on. Tell me about the pawn shops where you went when times were bleak and pawned the old lad's Sunday suit. To see you through the week. Tell me more of Vinti and how he won his crown. On that night, he has lit a bony that was seen all over town. Hagen's home baked sodas, Wilson's boiled pig's feet, Barney Conway's Guinness, Benton's famous meat, buttermilk from Turner's, Geordie's fresh ice cream, the Queen's and Joe McKibben's. All have vanished like a dream. Sometimes I wander down there and sort of make the rounds. I see them in my mind's eye and hear their phantom sounds. I hear their tumblers clinking. I see their faces playing. Please, sing a song of York Street and take me back again. Oh, that's lovely. That's really good. You know the thing about that? It's not just nostalgia. You know, uh, people might be listening to that. They may be thinking that you and I are two old duffers sitting here thinking about <laughs> times. I don't time. know about you, but I'm an old duffer. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about times gone past. But it's, it's more than that. See, now, you know, what we're living in a corporate world now and everybody do, does what they're told, basically. You, know, you have to because there's nothing you can do about it. But these are different people. These are independent people. These were not, not characters, but individuals. And you don't, uh, you don't get individuals like that, really too much these days because the society doesn't allow for it. Well, we're too much concerned now with television, Jerry. And, uh, You're all sitting staring at it. We live know? our life. Uh, I mean, the television lives our lives now. I mean, I personally am a radio man and I obviously at work I can't listen to radio but at home at night I would uh, listen to radio. I'm a great man for radio. I yeah. really enjoy radio. Is it funny how television actually rules our lives in a way? I was reading a very interesting story the other day and I don't know if anybody else read it with the same eyes that I did. Uh, apparently there's a girl who was in Coronation Street. I can't remember her name. She was, oh, well, she was involved in a shop and she married this guy and stuff. Recently she's out of it. But they had, uh, <clears throat> they had this program called OK TV, whereby this girl who was a, a character in Coronation Street is seen talking to all these celebrities. And she's swanning about London to the Met Bar and all these swanky places. And she's kind of, you know, going about in limousines. And uh, completely different to the part. And people didn't like her because they wanted her to be just a big girl behind the shop. They don't understand the nature of television. The girl who was playing that part didn't see any difference between playing Coronation Street and being playing the trendy person who's walking around London. But people watching TV kind of felt as if she betrayed them and they don't watch it because they don't like her because they want her to be just a big girl in the corner. Which actually, you know, tells me that people are actually living their lives vicariously because they're watching television. They're living their lives through other people. Well, I find that uh, they identify these characters with the characters they're playing. And they I mean, do, yeah. as far as, I mean, nobody knows the name of the actors or the actresses, but they know all the names of the soap, uh, the soap names that they have. <laughs> I know. We, uh, we had interest the other day. I mentioned the fact that you had recorded some of your work, but it was purely f uh, for, uh, for basically for the blind. Was that it? And we had a lot of inquiries about people asking uh, where they could get their hands on that. Do you know? Well, Jerry, I have, uh, if you'll allow me just a short blurb here, read 
It's just something on the history of it. The Blaine Centre is a local charity and it was founded in 1800 by a totally blind man called James Ford Smith. And today it supplies audio tapes to almost 2,000 blind people all over the province. And as you know, last year was the year of reading. And during this period, Dean Houston, who is the chief executive of the Blaine Centre at Knock Road in Belfast, met special services librarians with an idea to launch a project using local books on, on audio tape. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, books on audio tape, but no local tapes as far as I was told. So the project was aptly titled Speaking Volumes. And last week, the first three books recorded were launched in Belfast, Ballymena, Dungannon, Lurgan, Down Patrick and Oma. Uh, the, the three books concerned were My Lady of Chimney Corner, Children of Dunservic, and The Rose and the Blade. Now, the first two were performed by actors, but I had the privilege of recording my own work in a recording studio in the Blaine Centre under the watchful eye of David Galway, who's the audio technician mm. over there. Mm. Now, these books are now available from all libraries in Northern Ireland and also the mobile vans that travel around the country. And if any visually impaired person experienced difficulty getting one, they should get in touch with David Galway at the Blaine Centre. His number there is 654-366, and I suppose I could leave that with you mm -hmm. if anyone inquires. Now, as far as I'm told, there'll be another three books recorded next month. Their titles are The Old Jest, The Ulster Reciter, and Sweet Killock. And also, there are ten local books in the pipeline at the moment, with more to come. So this is good news for the visually impaired and other people who may find it difficult to lift and hold a book to read. And those of us who can read books in a normal way sometimes don't realise how lucky we are. And I personally think a great vote of thanks should go to Dean Houston and his staff at the Blaine Centre, and also Margaret Smith and the other special services librarians involved. I was quite privileged and uh, pleased to be involved in it and uh, quite happy to do it. All right. So that number, if anyone wants any, it's 654366, I think, is it? That's correct. That's a Belfast number. All right. Uh, talking to John Cal, we'll be talking to John again in a moment. Here's a few uh, uh, messages here. A caller has two spare tickets for the John Prine concert. Uh, contacted him today because he won't be in Belfast tomorrow. I'll contact the other chap and I'll give him his name. I'll just put that back. I'm amazing myself by my efficiency. Uh, a, person, uh, a person knows a petition that... No, no. A very happy birthday today to Margaret McMenamin from her husband Mark and children Danielle, Ryan and Owen. Have a nice day, it says. Obviously, people have been in America. Mr. Ivan McCallum wants to know why most of the shops in Northern Ireland are more than 50% more expensive than they are in England. The reason they are like that is because we give them the money. If we didn't give them, they wouldn't be fit. We should stop giving them any money. For John Fisher, he's laid up at home at the minute with a broken foot. That's from all the girls. Or as they say, a broken foot. <laughs> I nearly fell into the trap there. You know, the, the bullet trap. You either say bullet or bullet. Foot or foot. He's laid up with a broken foot from all the girls in Bertie's Day Nursery in Antrim. Uh, Patsy McCartney says, love to hear John Campbell. All the memories come flooding back. Patsy McCartney comes from York Street and is still in contact with John's brother as Mrs. Patsy McCartney. So there we are. So I believe you've got a special wee thing to do there, John. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, unfortunately, I heard yesterday that uh, one of our uh, really exceptional characters died suddenly. Uh, a lad called Tommy Little, with whom I spent many, many happy years. And uh, he worked on the docks along with us. A real wry uh, character, was full of one lane punchers, you know, mm. and uh, really a wit. Now, I'm sad to say that uh, the sketchiest of what I've heard, but I know that he, he is supposed to have taken a tremendous heart attack. Uh, I would like to dedicate this poem to Tommy's memory because uh, although I haven't seen much of him over the last maybe few years, he, he he played quite a part in my life and along with the other lads I've run about with. And uh, it's really hard to realise that, that this man is no longer on the earth. Uh, this poem is called I Am. And it's uh, sort of a different... Uh, type of poem from the usual stuff I read about fighting and work and uh, drinking. It's a sort of a, a philosophical type of thing. And uh, I would like to dedicate it to Tommy's memory. Okay. I am a song that someone is singing, strident yet soft, joyous yet sad. For just as long as a singer is singing, I must continue through good times and bad. I am a book that someone is reading, turning the pages with each passing day. 
until the last page is turned by the reader. I am committed to life, come what may. I am a story that someone is writing. Each day, a blank page is filled by the prose. And when the nib has been dipped for the last time, then I will dwell where a passing thought goes. That is in memory of my good friend Tommy Little, who will be sadly missed by the people of York Street. Here's another person, uh, a fellow called William from Cumber, uh, rings us and he asks, can you elaborate on the character of Big Davy, as he feels he knows the person you're talking about? Well, most people knew Davy, and the fact is that Davy was a, a four-man potato carrier uh, on Belfast stocks for maybe 40 years, and uh, the people who would have come in to the docks with uh, potatoes from all over Northern Ireland, sometimes even from the south, uh, Davy was well known to all these people. Oh, well known to all these people. So uh, he lived in the uh, York Street area on North Thomas Street, and he died, I think, was at the age of 83, and I, I'm, I'm sad to say that he actually died in my arms. We were talking in uh, one of the sheds on the dock, the public dock shed, where he was then employed as a night watchman, and we were speaking, as I am speaking to you now, Jerry, and he suddenly just dropped. I managed to grab him, get him to the floor, and uh, give him the kiss of life. And uh, he was my uncle. I managed to give him the kiss of life. I had to run about uh, two or three hundred yards to get to uh, a place where there was a telephone to get an ambulance. Yeah. By the time the ambulance arrived on the dock, arrived on the dock, Davy was well and truly dead. Now, that is the way Davy would like to have died. And uh, just on that, and coincidentally, I was flipping through uh, a book of photographs of the new lodge area uh, put together by uh, Joe Baker. Uh, a lovely, lovely presentation. I think I, I think I saw that. And lo and behold, I come across this page and there was Uncle Davy staring out at me with his walking stick and his dog. And uh, I was quite overjoyed to see that. Now, that book is one beautiful book. It's well worth anyone uh, getting in touch with Joe Baker and buying it. Yeah. And very cheap at the price it is, too. I've seen that, actually. That's come across my desk. Had a good, well, uh, it a is good look an absolute... Uh, it's a great production. And this is what we're lost for, Jerry, because we talk about words, but the old idea is a picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah. And when you flip through those particular pictures that uh, Joe Baker has picked up uh, and put into book format, you know, it's unbelievable. Well, your own stuff now, you, you've, you, the poems you've read today, a couple you've read today, are from The Rose and the Blade, but you've always... You've also published a novel called Corner Kingdom, which is about which is about the dogs. That's a hard out life, that isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I this was a pet um, pet thing of mine, and the old guys used to say to me, Campbell, you get this down. You make sure everybody knows the injustices of how this system operates. Put it together and uh, let people know. Uh, and it was quite un unbelievable the work conditions that that went on. In fact, the little guy that I just mentioned there, who, who died. Uh, he came on the dock a lot later than us, and he read the book, and he, we sat across the bar, and he said to me, Campbell, was it really like that? I said, it was. And there was a few expletives, and he says, I'm glad I wasn't working there then. <laughs> so, I mean... Uh, containerization. Containerization. <laughs> I love uh, that word, but yeah, it's a horrible uh, word. Uh, people yeah. uh, really destroyed. I mean, I know. you could, for instance, at a potato boat loading maybe 1,000 ton of potatoes... In the 50s, you know, say four gang, that would uh, constitute maybe the guts of 50, 60 people. That's right. Uh, to load maybe a thousand ton. It was taken uh, two or three days. In my later years as a container handler, a driving a container handler, I was able to load a thousand ton in the morning myself. That's right. Uh, because of the containers, just a matter of setting them to the crane and he put them into the uh, hatches which had the sections in them. I can still smell the smell. You know, I don't know if I told you this before, but I was kind of the enemy. Uh, in, in the, in the sixth, I was about 18, I had no sense. I used to work for a, a shipping agent called R.E. Burke. And one of my jobs was to go down in the morning to the potato boats and make sure, collect all the doctor's books. And when you realize that there was a lot of casual workers then, you had to go down the hold and get their names and addresses. No, you sure you could pay them. You generally got Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck. <laughs> Donald Duck, yeah. Mickey Mouse. And <clears throat> I wasn't terribly good at mathematics, so ev everybody used to get paid on a Thursday. Used to went to wages office on Thursday and used to get their wages on the Thursday afternoon. Of course, I was out of the office every Thursday and I never got back in until the Friday. So what the guys would do, as you well know, they might take a bottle of stout or two on the Thursday and by the time they get a bit fired up, they come over looking for me. But I would never be there. 
But on the Friday, I'd be there. Oh, By the time I'd be there, they'd be calmed down a bit. They say, so it wasn't too bad. But sometimes I used to have to get down on a Friday morning to one of the boats. And what they used to do was used to throw the hook at me. <laughs> you know, the hook that goes and ship to shore with it, with the potatoes. And Can't the guy, the, the fellow would be on yeah. the winch, he'd say, but he'd always warn you. He'd go, hey! <laughs> I know, but I was always waiting for it. You'd be walking along, you see, and you'd be looking around, and you wouldn't see it. And you, all you hear is a, hey! And you just duck, and away it went. And they just did that to spook you. Could be a quirk. I know! Yeah. They did spook you because, you know, they didn't really dislike you, but they give you a hard time. They didn't let you away with anything. Anyway, listen, read something else. Yep. Um, something of, of, of your choice. Well, there's one... It doesn't matter if it's long or short. Well, there's one that's quite popular. It's, it's called The Boss of the Town, and uh, I find that if I do a reading, people get a wee bit annoyed if I don't include this particular poem. <laughs> All right. And again, it's about tough guy, and I usually introduce it with the fact that... Um, like all the tough guys, uh, the only thing contained him was a woman. Right. So uh, it's called The Boss of the Town. I was drinking with Jimmy McGregor. He once was the boss of the town. There wasn't a man would face him. Then he suddenly quietened down. The reason for that, he got married to a sweet girl called Jenny McGee. I loved her myself, but conceded. She wanted him much more than me. The first time they met was in Barney's. Big Jimmy was wrecking the place. Then Jenny stormed in through the front door, a furious look on her face. It seems he had took on her brother and sent him home flat on his back. We Jan didn't stop for a statement. She stormed straight into the attack. Big Jim lost his feelings for combat. As Jenny's nails tore his chest, he guffed and laughed at her efforts and treated it all as a jest. They cut it all short. They were fated. And that put myself in a whirl. For up to that violent meeting... Jenny McGee was my girl. I went to Big Jim when I heard it. Though nervous, I put forth my case, flinching each time he flaxed muscle, expecting his fist in my face. But I needn't have bothered to worry. Big Jim had turned gentle and kind, and nothing but sweet thoughts of Jenny were floating around in his mind. Well, anyway, I was their best man. The wedding was frantic and gay. He looked like a king. And her beauty was never as rare as that day. But that was a couple of years back. And Jimmy had changed quite a bit. His face bore the marks of a beating. The suit he had on didn't fit. He sensed I was feeling quite puzzled and heaved a laborious sigh. He said in a voice thick with passion, I've just watched my sweet Jimmy die. My Jenny was all out long, for I thanked the Lord each silvery morn. I thought I would be twice as happy when our coming baby was born. He then smashed my drink from the table and snarled, If you'd had any drive, you wouldn't have let me steal Jenny, and Jenny would still be alive. My fist hit him high on the cheekbone. He sprawled in a heap to the floor. He rose to his feet and said, tiredly, Come on, laddie. Try it once more. My reason was turned to me swiftly. Not one more attack would I launch. Big Jim was the best in the city against him. I hadn't a chance. But he didn't fight back. He just stood there. A beaten look, bleak in his eye. He gazed at the floor for a moment. I felt very sad for the guy. Laddie, his voice held a tremor. My son and my Jenny were dead. God couldn't take the big tough guy. So he took my loved ones instead. But I'm going to fool all and have him remember the guys I could chin. Well, I'm going to fight them all over, but this time I ain't going to win. So take some more pokes at me, laddie. I know I gave you a hard time. His voice was too soft to be heated, for Jenny was still on his mind. He turned on his heels and walked from me. And neither a word did we speak. The moist in my eyes didn't stop me from noting a tear on his cheek. A week from the day that he left me, he died in a public house brawl. Drove on by the grief that possessed him since he first heard sweet Jenny's call. But I'll tell you for certain, those bullies would not have put Big Jimmy down in the days before he met sweet Jenny. When he was the boss of the town. 
John's still here with me. John, I'm sorry. Excuse me a second. I know they're a bit organized here. I'm trying to flick through a couple of messages that were for you. And I've... Oh, yes. Here we go. Uh, do you remember the blue Peter Cafe? Apparently it was always filled with sailors eating big breakfasts. No, well, everybody eat big breakfast in those days. You needed them. The big fry. Yeah. Where was the blue Peter Cafe? No, to be honest, I'm not quite sure. I can't really remember where the blue Peter was. Uh, I know there was a cafe in Short Street uh, beside the American bar. Right. Where we would have got the sausage bobs for <laughs> two bob and old money. And that I, seems a lot for a sausage bob. Oh, but it was good stuff. A big... Oh, Horace Bop and a big bottle of milk along with it. With his memory. It. Oh, you needed it down there. <laughs> That's from Doreen Cork. She's inquiring about the uh, Blue Peter Cafe. Uh, please ask, John, when is the next Sailor's Town get-together in York Street? Do you know that? Well, I, I know there was one not so long back in the Douglas Club. Unfortunately, I was working and was unable to appear uh, at that as a spectator, of course. But uh, it was quite a success. And uh, I think that the Dockers Club would be able to pass on any, any information like that. The Dockers Club in Pilot Street. Okay, then. Will you read us another one, John? Yeah, uh, Jerry, before I, I read you another one, I'd just like to mention on this book. Now, this book, The Rose and the Blade, was what I would call a happy accident. Because yeah. uh, as we talked about Corner Kingdom, I was trying to paddle it. And Patrick uh, Ramsey of Lagan Press uh, asked me for some poetry for another book, which I had no intention of doing at that particular time. Now, I sent Patrick a disc, and Patrick collected the poems, uh, chose them, chose the title for the book, and chose the front piece for the book. So technically, the book would have been Patrick's uh, baby. Okay. I mean, and I'm, I'm quite glad, because obviously it's quite a popular book. But uh, I, I'll read you this poem. Uh, years ago, when we were on the docks, we had the saying, the brew every day, the, the dole, we had the saying at the centre every day. And you'd stand in this big long queue and the guy beside you and, you know, you were just burned off and you were getting, I think we were getting about four and ten pence a day and old money, you know. Sure. And, uh, you know, what we used to say to each other, I wouldn't have agreed if I put it in a letter and posted it out to you. And now that's what's happening. <laughs> so this, this poem <clears throat> is a cry from those days and it's called, uh, Casual curses. Right. Did you ever say in the bloody brew, the bloody brew, the bloody brew, you stand for hours in a big long queue in the bloody brew in Belfast? Did you ever say in the casual box, the casual box, the casual box? They say them lads take some hard knocks on the casual box in Belfast. They make you say in there every day, every day, every day. And stop your dole if you go astray on the casual box in Belfast. Report for work at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. But there's no bloody work on the Belfast dock for the casual man in Belfast. They'd starve your kids on the word of a jerk. The word of a jerk. The word of a jerk who'll say you didn't turn out for work on the casual box in Belfast. And the way they look when they paired your dockets, paired your dockets, paired your dockets, you'd think it was out of their own bloody pockets and the bloody brew in Belfast. I hope to God when my life is through, life is through, life is through, where I go, they don't have any bloody brew like the bloody brew in Belfast. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I love that. Casual curses. That's from Rose in the Blade. John Calvin, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you in the studio. I don't know why I didn't do this months ago. And will you come in again sometime? Pleasure to be here, Jerry. And as I said, any time, no problem. I enjoy listening to your program when I get the chance to do it. And again, I thank you very much for the publicity you've given this particular book. Not at all. I think you're a genius. Okay, <laughs> thank John, you thanks. Much. Thank you very much. Bye.